Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining our webinar today, our Lunch and Learn webinar. And today we have the pleasure actually to listen to Chanel Gricko, who is the founder of Saperis, a company that provides uh, in house training and consulting services for the Google G Suite. And Chanel will talk about why we actually should have all a basic understanding of coding. And you can actually start with that today. So before we start, uh, yeah, everyone successfully logged in, that that's great. Um, I will actually start with a quick introduction about Reshape Tech for those who don't know uh, us already. And then we directly, uh, you know, hand over to Chanel uh, with her knowledge sharing session that uh, will um, remain about 45 minutes. And then at the end, we have a nice Q&A session for 15 minutes, depending on your questions, ending the webinar around 1.15. So before I just start, uh, I would kindly ask you to post your name and your job role in the chat that we have uh, here in Zoom. Just for us, it's very interesting to know who, who joins today. And uh, after my short introduction from Reshape Tech, like we can have maybe one or two voices quickly saying um, what their motivation was to, uh, to participate in today's webinar. Thank you. About me quickly, I am Geraldine. Um, so I'm an active supporter for WeShape Tech since January. Uh, I work for IBM as a senior consultant. So I have a business background, but was already or always very interested in tech and innovation. And then I met uh, power women uh, last year at an event from We Shape Tech and I decided uh, that it would be very nice to be actually uh, a part of their team. So uh, I had the idea of launching this uh, Lunch and Learns. We started with one physical event and then due to coronavirus we actually had to switch to webinars but this is this is me and uh, yeah if you are interested to know more about me please write me uh, over LinkedIn um, after the webinar. What is WeShape Tech? WeShape Tech is a uh, initiative uh, slash network for greater inclusion and diversity in tech and innovation. And we actually already have four chapters in Switzerland. So we are the Zurich team now uh, doing this uh, or running these webinars. But we also have a great team in the Le Mans, in Basel and in Bern. WeShape Tech is actually built on four pillars. So on the left side, you can see we actually uh, not only build up our, our own network, so we have like a strong community already, but we also want to act as a network platform. And we really want that you can benefit uh, of our network. So we also have some networking events um, where in, in which you can participate. Uh, but also when you follow us on LinkedIn, uh, etc., you, you actually, you can be part of our WeShape Tech community. Then as a second pillar, um, we want to inspire by role models. So we organize events uh, or, or now like in digital formats like this Lunch and Learn, uh, where we invite like speakers, uh, which we think or we think uh, are very interest interesting uh, in order to get to know, but also share our values and uh, are, are people who can, can, can learn you uh, something. So today our role model is actually Chanel and uh, she, will, she, will, uh, she will talk in a, in a minute. Then for insights, this is all about knowledge sharing. So we really aim for um, providing you new know-how uh, that you can actually gain new skills. Um, and we really like would like have a hands-on strategy um, that yeah that you can at least have a glance or get some, some new insights about a topic that you probably then uh, will will, will um, follow up uh, later. So this is all about the insights, and then at the end the empowerment is is all together. So we really want to empower our community, our network with all the events we do and our activities uh, on, on, on social media, etc. So, yeah, we are really active uh, online. Uh, for those uh, of you who didn't subscribe yet to our newsletter, we run a monthly newsletter and it would be very nice if you subscribe uh, today, if you're interested in um, 
here you have the links. Um, I can share that at the end of this presentation again. So let's see who is here today. Uh, I think we received nice like uh, input in the chat. So maybe Melanie, you, you would like to start quickly and, and tell who you are and why, why are you here today? Thank you. Uh, so I'm a board member of Wish Attack, but I'm also a co-founder and CMO at uh, Expense Robot, a fintech startup in Zurich. Cool. And you are interested in to know how it is coding. <laughs> I'm very much interested into coding, of course, because we have a lot of uh, engineers and are always looking for, for new people who are interested in. Yes. Uh, so then I can also see Sabrina. Sabrina, you joined. So maybe you can just quickly say who you are. Hello together. Uh, I'm Sabrina. I'm a community builder at SIX. Uh, it's a Swiss stock exchange, for example. And I'm here because I was always thinking about to learn coding, but I was kind of maybe a little bit too lazy and I had a lot of other topics that I burned more for it, but uh, maybe you get today inspiration why I should really start with it. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Okay, great. So let's start with Janelle then. Um, so for the Q&A, please post your questions you have again in the chat. So at the end, uh, I'll moderate uh, the questions uh, together with, uh, with Janelle. And then at the very end, we can still open up if, if anyone has like, a, you know, want to use your voice and, and ask a question. But so far during the presentation, post your questions in the chat. So I'll hand over to you, Janelle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me take over the screen. Um, everybody else should make sure that their microphone is off. There you go. You should be able to see my screen now. Perfect. So let's get this started. Okay, so the title of my talk is why we all should have basic coding knowledge and how you can start with it today. A very, very bold statement, I know, but I think it's worth it. And as we heard from Sabrina, some of you are still out there looking for inspiration and still guessing, should I learn to code or not? And I hope that this gives you the need to push to actually do so. Um, my talk will be two separate parts. The first actually is quite personal. It's my journey into tech, what I experienced, what I've learned from it, and what I believe others can learn from it. And the second part is, well, it's a lunch and learn. So we're here to learn something, and I'm going to show you some light co uh, life coding. We'll be automating the formatting of a Google spreadsheet document. So this might be actually something that you would want to use in your day-to-day -day work life or at home. And I'll also be providing you with the code, but you can watch me code. And for those of you who feel up to it, you can also try to code along. Okay, so let's start with my journey. And we're going way back. I mean, we're talking almost 40 years ago. It's the year of 1983. What happened in that year? Well, quite a lot happened. In January, it was more or less the birth of what we call our internet because the TCP IP, this is a protocol that is used to send data over the internet that was made the standard protocol for something called the ARPANET, which was created by the US military. And that's the predecessor of our internet. The CD was launched. Um, Lotus Note spreadsheet was launched, something you couldn't automate back then. In June, a highlight for NASA, Sally Wright, the first American woman went into space. Um, the first mobile network was launched in Chicago in October. Now, if you have a, a look at that image, I don't think any of us would have wanted to carry around that huge cell phone. But I mean, that's the basis for the for the technology, for the smartphone technology we have today. And another example in October, there was a software that was launched, the word processor that actually was then acquired by Microsoft and became Microsoft Word, a software we're still using today. And in November, you're probably noticing something's missing. Well, that was my parents' highlight because I was born. And on a side note, you know how they say, oh, every mother, when she sees her baby, she thinks, this is the most 
beautiful baby ever. That's not what my mom thought when she saw me. There you go. That's actually me. I usually get a quite, quite a lot of laughs when people see that. So I was born in a time where a lot of, where technology was emerging. So it, it wasn't like today where everybody had their smartphone, even five-year-old kids, but the technology we're using was very much based back then. So let's fast forward 10 years into my journey. And my father bought our first computer. And the guy who sold him the computer actually installed this game on it. This is Indiana Jones. And it was, for me, love at first play, if I may say so. So I really fell in love with video games, something I still enjoy playing today, if I ever find the time. And it also opened up the world of technology to me because this was the first time I actually came in contact with the computer and um, I had to learn how to use this computer. There are, my parents didn't really have more knowledge than I did. So after a couple of months, I actually was the person at home who had the most knowledge. And you know, kids with new technology, there's just no fear. You just try out stuff and you, 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 you learn how to use it. And that's how it was. For me, it was very natural. It came very natural working with the computer. So a couple of years on, I had to decide on, you know, what do I want to be? What do I want to learn? I was in high school and I really loved technology. This was something that, yeah, I could say, looking back, it was a passion of mine. And I had an email address. Now, you might be thinking, well, we all have email addresses. Well, back then, it was a cool thing to chat with your friends via email because keep in mind, we didn't really have smartphones. We were teenagers. We couldn't afford expensive smartphones. So having an email address was pretty cool. But there was a problem. I was a rather introvert, shy, 15-year-old girl, and I really wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in. And looking around me, the only people I saw working with computers were men. So teams, they looked like this to me, only men. And that was a bit troublesome for me. I remember I had one school colleague who um, actually did go into tech. So he did the, what we call informatic related, the um, IT um, apprenticeship. And I remember understanding that there were only boys in the class. And I was horrified by this thought of, of not belonging, of, of, of feeling like I'm, I'm a misfit because I would be the only girl in a class like that. And that for me, that's my first takeaway. I want to be an example for girls and young women and I want to tell them how fun it is to be in tech and, and share this passion with them so that they understand, hey, this is a path that, you know, that is also meant for women. It's not only for men. Now, you might be saying, Chanel, you just were born in the wrong decade. If you would have been born 10, maybe 20 years later, it would have been totally different. You know, the ratio of men and women in tech teams is 50 50. No, it's still not. And I mean, we've all read the studies of how long it's going to take to reach parity. So it's, it's going to take quite a while. And that's why I think it's great that a lot of organizations and even governments are doing their part. But I believe that each and every one of us can do our little part as well. Now, you might be saying, well, I'm not a software developer. I'm, I'm not an IT project manager. How am I supposed to play a part in this? Well, Last year, when I was working as a coding teacher, one of my students told me the following, you know, when I asked her, so tell me, Noemi, why, why are you learning to code? Because from what I understand, you don't, want, you don't want to become a software developer. So what's your motivation? And she told me the following. She said, you know, I have two little girls at home, and I really would love for them to give tech a try as their career. But if they were then to ask me, well, mom, did you give tech a try? Did you try to code? And I would have to say no. That would be a really bad example. So she was setting example and saying, I'm learning how to code, even though I'll never become a software programmer. And she, it's not for her. It's not something that she says, oh, this is what I want to be. But she wants to set an example by learning the basic coding skills so that she can be an example for her daughters. 
Now, in my personal case, I don't have children, but I make a point of talking to young girls like my friend's daughters and telling them about tech and, and being really passionate. And, and something I've really noticed is that when you show the passion you have for tech, that's something that's contagious, that will make him want to look at it. And a couple of years back, I did the same thing with a young friend of mine, and she was just in that transition of what should I learn, what should I become? And she gave it a try, and you know what? She's a front-end engineer today, and she loves programming. And I'm so happy to, that I did that, because it was a perfect match between tech and her, and, um, and her team is also very happy that she, that she, as a female developer, joined them. Okay, so that was my first takeaway. Well, after a while, I did break into the tech industry. So um, a friend of my then boyfriend had uh, his own tech company um, and he hired me as a first level computer supporter. And I was thrilled and I was eager to learn and I was asking questions and I, I really, really loved it. But I worked in an almost all male team. So the technicians and all the other supporters, they were only males. And it was a very competitive nature. I didn't really feel comfortable there. And I really remember this one situation where one of the technicians walked up to my desk and I had this book on my desk that was about um, tech, you know, about explaining what is a processor, what is hardware, this and that. And he looked at the book and then he laid it down and he laughed at me like, you need to read books, you're not good enough. And, and that was, that hurt, that wasn't nice. And I'm not saying that all men were like that, definitely not. I've also had great um, team colleagues, male who really supported me, who, who were there for me. But the negative, um, the negative experiences I've had, sadly, usually were men. The few I had, they were men or that, you know, like the engineering um, department would say, oh yeah, Chanel's cute, but her technical not knowledge is not that great. That's not something you would say about a guy. Oh, he's good looking, but he's not that good at tech. But anyway, that's what I experienced. On the other hand, what I also experienced is a nice balance. So when I was working as a junior software developer, my um, mentor, he was a senior developer, 20 plus years um, experience in developing. And I also on that team had a, a little bit of younger, actually she was younger than me, a software developer. And what struck me about her was the empathy. So I had like a perfect balance between somebody, you know, with a lot of hard skills, a lot of technical knowledge, and someone with the soft, soft skills to build me up. Because learning something new and also learning something as complex as, for example, programming is not easy. And a lot of people start doubting on their own intelligence, and I did too. And having someone there, you know, who could feel those emotions in me and who could build me up and tell me, listen, you know, I know it's difficult, but I learned it and you will too. That for me made all the difference. And that's why I believe it's great if we have diverse teams where we can support each other and, and that just simply make the whole experience of learning much, much nicer and smoother. And I think that if you might not have that at work, then initiatives like We Shake Tech are all the more important because we come together now at the moment only online, but I also enjoy going to the, to the real life meetings that We Shake Tech organizes because I like the community. I like the, the way we support each other, we build each other up, we learn from each other's experiences. And that is something very valuable. And that's why if you are in a position, you know, to, to also have a diverse team, to create a diverse team, I think the whole team in the end will benefit from that. Okay, so a couple of years later, um, I already had learned how to code. I've, I'd worked as a software developer. I was asked to, to join a team where the former e-commerce manager had left before the new online shop was launched. So I had to take over the project and, and, and finish it. And what I really noticed, so we're talking about a role here where I had no coding, no system engineering, nothing to do, nothing technical. I'm just at a level of CMS, you know, putting content in the CMS, but also, of course, um, communicating with the developers. And that's where I noticed that my 
tech skills that I had gained that also the knowledge of programming, of coding was really beneficial because it helped me to communicate with the developers, with the technical employees of this project in, on a totally different level. And when they would explain technical problems, you know, I might not have never done exactly that what they were doing, but the understanding I had around me would help me to, to better understand them and also, you know, to faster than um, decide on, on solutions. And I think that that was overall, it helped to, to make the outcome of the project possible. And this is my takeaway for you, for, for everybody, male or female, doesn't matter. The more technical skills you have, the better you are at your job. Um, think of UX designers. You interact closely with software developers or project managers, um, product managers, product owners, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of us work in teams where we're creating software, digital tools, and so on and so forth. The more you know, the more you can bring your ideas into these tools and the smoother the communication and the collaboration is with others. And this is actually what led to the title of my talk that I believe basic coding knowledge is something that is good and beneficial for every single person out there. And if you think about it, um, did any of you not use a digital tool up until now, 1230? Probably not. So we're surrounded by digital tools. Wouldn't it make sense to understand them better, to, to have a better insight of what they're actually doing? I very much believe so, and it's something I enjoy. Now, this is something that I didn't expect. Learning how to code has made me a lifelong learner because uh, especially when I was starting out uh, with coding, I always thought like, oh, I'm terrible. I have to Google and I have to search and I don't know. Well, it turns out even my, my, uh, my mentor that I mentioned 20 plus years of development, well, he still has to Google things because developers know that they know nothing and they're constantly in a learning mode. And I found that to be very refreshing. And yeah, it kind of resonates also with my personality. I've always been somebody who was into reading and learning. And now with, with um, having learned how to code, it's something that's really, you know, it's really become me. And that doesn't mean that I'm finished learning, not at all. For example, um, a couple of weeks ago, I had to update the security certificate on my web server. So I have on Google, I, since I'm specialized in Google products, I chose to use a virtual machine. So my whole saperis.io website is in Google Cloud. And, and I have a virtual machine running there, a, a virtual server. And I had to update the cert security certificate. And I found a documentation that I was, you know, following. I have to admit, I, I was, it was early in the morning and, and I wasn't paying close attention and I messed up. So by the time I went to restart my server, it kept on failing. Now, you should never do something like this right before you have other things to do. So the whole day I had to actually work for customers and I couldn't, I couldn't fix my own website. So my website was down literally almost the whole day. And by the evening when I finally got the time to look at it, you know, it's, Either it's, you look at it like, this is a huge problem and I'm mad at myself. I was a bit disappointed, but I try to look at stuff like that, like a challenge. It's a challenge to learn something you knew. And literally by the end of the day, my server was up and running again because I just kept on and I learned so much. Now we're talking about, you know, security protocols, uh, certificates, and, and kind of like more system engineering and, and DevOps. This is not something I really have experience in. So I was learning something new and I had to find a solution to a problem. I mean, I founded this company on my own. I'm the IT team, there's no one else. So if I mess some, some, something up, I have to solve it. And I learned so much. And this is something I've learned through coding. Yes, I've also broken customers' applications, but then you find the bug, you fix it, and you learn it. And lifelong learning, I believe, is something that nobody can afford to ignore it because you can't expect to finish with your, I don't know, your bachelor's degree with 23, 24, and then say, so now I'm working the next 40 years and I'll never learn anything new. That's just not the way the, the world works. And 
technology is advancing so fast that you know you just have to keep on learning and this is something that learning how to code really has done for me and the final takeaway for me is confidence i learned something that a lot of people put off as that's too difficult to learn or maybe like sabrina mentioned before i've just never found the time to do it um others think you know i'm terrible at math i'll never learn coding well i'm terrible at math too but you know this is something that i'm really happy that it was my dream and i stuck to it it was difficult but you know i succeeded and i'm also happy that i didn't give up when others were making fun of me or you know, I, I remember like one job as a front end engineer when I was just learning how to code, how this one person who wanted to hire me at the end, I mean, everything was perfect, but I had to work through a demo, which was something that I wouldn't even have to do at my jobs, like databases and this and that. I had no idea. And he's just like, yeah, you don't have to do that at your job, but I just want to see, you know, how you would deal with something difficult. And I, I felt miserably at it. Okay. I felt miserably. And he then gave me the feedback, well, you know, I don't see your potential, so, you know, I'm not going to give you the job. And I remember how that day I was so depressed. I, I spent the rest of the day in front of the PlayStation. I just turned off my brain and went gaming. But the day afterwards, I said, and I'm going to prove him wrong. And a couple of years later, actually, I made it as a software developer. And by chance, I saw him at an event and I told him, you know what you told me back then? Well, I didn't give up. I actually succeeded at becoming a software developer. But what makes me the most happy is that through my journey, through learning how to code and through my passion of sharing this with others, I've actually helped others to learn how to code themselves. And it's, it's something that I, it's a feeling I almost can't describe. When you're there after a whole uh, day of teaching and the, the students, you know, trying to make their code work and they're really tired, but they're like, so happy and say finally i understand this that is something so rewarding and my journey has led to me being this rather introvert shy little girl to a confident woman who said at the beginning of this year okay so now i think it's time to start my own company and to teach people how to use software, how to automate um, Google Apps by writing Google Apps Script. And I'm, I don't think I would have had this confidence without what I went through and without also the, the learning of, of writing software of, of coding. This was enorm, enormously important for me. So I believe that coding and tech gave me a confidence boost and it will give a confidence boost to anybody who's willing to put in the work and to learn something that admittedly, it's, it's not very, very easy and it takes some time and dedication, but it's definitely possible. And that's why to sum it all up, I would say, if we lead by example, we can shape future tech teams. We can be examples for young girls out there who aren't sure, should I get into tech or not? Is this something for women as well? Let's show them that it is and that they can learn it because we learned it as well. So that's the personal part. That's the journey part of what I experienced. And what I'd now like to do is um, go into the, the coding part, the hands-on coding demo. And we'll be doing so with Google Apps Script. What is Google Apps Script? Mm, I imagine most of you haven't heard of it yet. It's a scripting language that's based on JavaScript. And JavaScript is one of the three technologies that still today we use for, for websites. And that would be HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript. So if you've ever written any lines of code of JavaScript, you'll be learning Google Apps Script in no time. It's really very easy to, to understand how Google Apps Script works. And it's something that's built into the Google products like Google Sheets, Google Docs, or Gmail 
it's already built in. You write it in a script editor in your Chrome browser. So there's no need for you to install any software for this. And once you've written these scripts that automate something, that do something, and you hit run, well, what happens is that it runs on the Google web servers. So there's no need for you to have like a, a development environment and a production environment. That's, that's not necessary. That's not needed. And to sum it up, I would say Google Apps Script is something very easy to learn. So for those of you who say, um, I'm looking for my first programming language, I think that uh, Google Apps Script is, is a good option to do so. Okay, so what will our demo scenario be today? Um, think of the following. You have a report from an analytics tool from some external data source, and um, you extract a couple of numbers, analytics numbers, and put them in a Google spreadsheet. Now you want that to look in a certain way. Maybe you have your corporate design with your colors or with your, with your font that you like to use. Um, and this is what we want to do. We want to create a custom menu item in Google Spreadsheets. So in Google Sheets that we, when we click on it, it automatically formats that report for us. And that's what we'll be writing together. So it looks something like this. Um, you see the, on the top screen or on the top image, you see our kind of like our blank report just with the values in it. And then on the bottom, you see how we're going to format it. Now this of course is a very simple example. Uh, you could make it more complicated, but I think for starters, we'll keep it easy. Now, before I start writing code, I usually think through my code. So I think through the algorithm that I want to write. And in our case, it'll be the first step to access our active spreadsheet that we have open in Google Sheet and stored in a variable. Once we've done that, we'll identify our header row as well as the whole table with the content, with the values, and we'll store those two things, those two objects in separate variables. And then we'll change the format of our header row, the format of our table, and we will create a filter for our header row. Now, I can't literally see all of you, but some of you might be thinking, wait, hold on. Algorithm, that sounds super complex. Well, here's the thing, it doesn't have to be. Because algorithm is nothing else than a step-by-step -step sequence of operations. And we all have algorithms in our daily lives. For example, the one here, my morning algorithm, I get out of bed, take a shower, drink a yummy espresso and ride my bike to work. Now it's a given that if I try to switch up these steps and I try to ride my bike to work before I actually get out of bed, my daily algorithm is going to fail. It's definitely not going to work. And the same thing is when you write down and you write like an automation script the way we'll be doing now. You think it through first. So where's my starting point? What's my ending point? And what are the separate steps that I have to define in order to get, let's say, from A to be. So that's what, uh, what an algorithm is. Now I also mentioned something called variables. Variables are a storage that contain values. This still might sound a bit abstract, but I'm sure we've all seen something like this in math, um, in math classes when we were back at school. A plus B equals C. And what did our teachers say? Well, A, B, and C can hold any value. It could be, for example, one plus three equals four. I mentioned I'm terrible at math and I have to admit, I don't like numbers. So I like the following example much better. A, B, and C could stand for pumpkin plus pie equals pumpkin pie. So the value that we store in those variables, that's up to us, that depends on our script. So if ever, anybody ever wants to make me a cake, it's a pumpkin pie, please. Okay, so now it's time to write our code. And to do so, I prepared a Google spreadsheet. This is our weekly analytics that you saw the screenshot of before. And the way to add my automation is by going to tools and then to script editor. 
and it opens up the built-in script editor. So this is nothing I had to install. This is provided by Google in Spreadsheet, in Docs, wherever, in whatever app of theirs. And the first thing I'll do is I'll give it a name. Uh, format report, I'll save it like so. And this here is just, um, this is just kind of like, I wouldn't say dummy code, but it's, um, it's where we will write our code inside. Now, just wait a second. I have to quickly go and get my code. Where is it? Oh, I forgot my own code. Ba, 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 ba. By the way, since I'm gonna have one second to search this, are there any questions up until now? Shedeldeen, I know this is improvised. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Um, just mute your, unmute yourself. If you want to have a question. No questions. We're all still stuck on variables and, and algorithms. Maybe okay. A quick one. A quick one. Go ahead. Um, if you say this is all run on Google servers, do they have any like writes on the code you're going to write? Uh, no. So everything you do on, on Google Cloud is yours. Um, also, like if you have G Suite or not, everything belongs to you. So Google doesn't get to, to access any of that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So by the way, what I totally forgot to, to mention is that I'll be working through, uh, or what you see now, that's, that's you see my chanel.greco at saperis.io. That is actually my G Suite business account. So I have a paid business account that I'm using, but um, you can do this with your Gmail account, with your standard Google account. You don't actually need to, to have a paid account, which is a pretty cool thing. So I have to admit, I'm struggling a bit. I lost my code. Where'd it go? How do we say in German, the demo effect? Any uh, other questions at the moment? Nope. Da, 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 da. Let me just quickly see. Okay, so the first thing we we'll want to do is say let sheet. And let is a keyword to write a variable. And then we'll say spreadsheet app dot get active spreadsheet. There you go. So what we're doing here, let me go ahead and save that. What we're doing here is we're getting this active spreadsheet here. So let me just check something quickly. There you go. You guys still hear me, right? Yeah. Perfect. You can see the Excel. You can see the, you can see this here? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So my code is loading up over here. There you go. Okay, so once we've gotten our active spreadsheet, the second thing we'll wanna do is we'll want to identify our headers. So we're accessing the variable that we created before, the sheet. So that's containing our spreadsheet. And we're saying sheet.get range. And you'll be wondering in a second, how does she know that range? Well, I'll show you. So what we're accessing here is nothing else than A1 till F1. Huh? Very good. And then we're going to go and create a third variable. And there you go. And that which is saved there is this here. Hmm? So that's what we're saving in that third variable. So once we've 
we've gotten these three variables, we can actually start manipulating these objects. And we'll do so, you know what, actually, I'm just going to copy paste this. This is a bit tedious to write, and I'll explain what we're doing. So we're changing the styling, the format of our header row by giving it the font weight of bold. We're setting the font color, and we're also setting the background color too. This is a hexadecimal code, so this is going to um, change the color, the background color of the header row to purple, which is my uh, momentary uh, favorite color. Good, so we have our table here. So here we're formatting our table to change the font. We're centering the whole information in our, in our table, and we're also setting a border, setting a custom color, and give it the border style of solid. So we'll see afterwards what that does. And the last step is to say table create filter. Okay. So as you see, I nicely indent this. This is not something you necessarily have to do in order for your code to run, but it's something that helps you to keep um, your code nice and tidy and also makes it easier to work together with others because nobody looks likes looking at a code that's that's messy okay so uh, you know what we want to do we want to rename this function to format report so this is our function that we wrote that afterwards when it'll run it'll format our code um, our, our report automatically so Maybe quickly here, you see how we're saying spreadsheet dot get active spreadsheet. I'm using dot a lot. Why am I actually doing that? Let me go back to our presentation. You'll see that we're using what we call the dot notation. So what you see here on let sheet, that's the variable we're creating. So we're kind of like creating a placeholder and we're storing our object, our spreadsheet.app object in there. And there's a method provided on this object, which is to get active spreadsheet. That's what I said, where we're actually having our code look at our spreadsheet and it's like, oh, this is the active spreadsheet. Okay, I'm gonna store that in this variable. And that's how you use objects and methods to do something. Now you might be asking yourself, how would I know what object to use and what method? I have no idea. Well, here's the thing. Google tells you what to use. Because when you create um, a software for others that they can like automate things like Google has done with Google Apps Script, then you usually also provide a documentation. It's kind of like the manual that you buy when let's say you have, um, I don't know, a new car. I know a lot of people don't read manuals but i do when we buy a new car i read through the manual so this i do the same thing when i'm learning something new in tech i read the documentation of the manufacturer because who knows best how to use their their tools and so what's really nice about this documentation as you see here on the screenshot it really shows me it doesn't only really explain what it does but it gives me code snippets it gives me code examples of, of how to use this code and that's how i know that i have a spreadsheet app object and I have a get active sheet, for example, or get active spreadsheet method that I can use to interact with my report. Okay, now we want to do the second part of our automation. And that would be that we want to create a custom menu in our Google spreadsheet that we can then click on and then it formats our report. And we do so again by writing a little script and here's the algorithm that we'll be writing. So we access the UI of the spreadsheet and again, we store it in a variable. Then we create a new menu, a custom menu. We add an item to that menu and then we add the newly created menu to our UI so that it appears when we open up this document next time. Okay, so then let's go back to our code in our script editor and we'll add a second function. We'll call it on open this time. And we'll see, uh, or we'll say get 
the uh, let UI. So we're creating a new variable and giving it the name UI. And by the way, the way I name my functions and my variables, that's really up to me. So I could write function O and uh, variable U. It will work. The, com the, the server understands me. But I guarantee you the next time you look at your code, let's say in two weeks, you won't remember what O and U is. So always think of, you know, giving your variables and functions names that actually make sense to you and hopefully also to others. And we'll also, again, access the spreadsheet app object, but this time we'll set, we'll say get UI. It gets the user interface. And then we're chaining methods. We're using the create menu. And the caption is the name that's going to appear in the menu. And we'll give it the name of WeShape Tech Spreadsheet Magic. Also that, to that name, it's up to me. Whatever I want to name my, my menu, I can. And we'll say add item. And again, we have a, oops, let me delete that. It makes it a bit clearer. We, we have a name of the menu item and I'm going to call it format report. And the function name. So once I click on that button, I have to define which function is going to be triggered. And that's this function here, the format report. So that's our automation of um, the formatting of our, of our table. So I name it format report, just the way it's named up there. And the last thing is I have to do is I have to add it to the UI so that it actually appears. Okay. So I'll save my code. And what I'll then do is I'll go to my report. And since we're in a browser, opening up the, the um, file is kind of like refreshing the browser. So if I refresh this browser, it's like getting a, a fresh um, version from the server. And that should, if we did it correctly, that should trigger our code. Let's go ahead and do that. And then there should appear a custom menu. Let's see what happens. There you go. We ship tech spreadsheet magic. So every single time now I open up this document, it's going to trigger. And I click on format report. This is crucial and very important because what's happening now is I'm being asked for authorization for my script to actually um, manipulate or access this file that I'm in, this document I'm in. I'll say continue. I'll choose my account, allow it or grant it access. Mm -hmm. And now if I click it, let's see if it works. Running script, there you go. So that was our automated um, formatting of our Google spreadsheet by writing a bit of code. So no rocket science, not much to it. Good, let's hop back to our presentation. So we wrote that. And you'll be getting the, the, this, this presentation I'm holding. So um, I linked the code here. Um, if you want to write it yourself, as I said, you do not need a paid G Suite account. You can also do this with a normal Google account that you might just use for YouTube. So head over to, uh, to Google Sheets, click on Tools, Script Editor, and the code will be there. So it's the exact code. And I also, um, I, I, um, I explain in the code what I'm doing. So with every step, you'll also see a comment explaining what this actually does. And what I also did, because maybe you're like me and like to learn with videos, um, I made a tutorial video of this um, tutorial that I just went through and I go a bit more into in depth also like what are objects, what are methods and I'm also in the video, I also give you real life examples to, to kind of like put it into concept. So it's, it's not only a video about how to actually create the script, but it goes a bit into the basics of programming um, the way I like to, to teach people. Well, from my point of view, that's it. Um, thank you very much for, for being uh, here, for being such good listeners. Um, and yeah, I think, Geraldine, you wanna start with the Q&A? Yes, that would be perfect. Thank you very much, Janet. So 
You're welcome. And now I don't have anything in the chat. So um, I think we can, we can also opening up. I mean, please post your question in the chat if you have now. Or just raise your voice and ask the question. I think we can be flexible here. <laughs> I hope it wasn't way too complicated. Hi, this is Teresa I'm from Zurich. Can you hear me well? Yes. Hi. First of all, thank you very much for your super inspiring and very interesting and hands-on um, compact webinar. I really liked it and it definitely got me very motivated. I remember I downloaded like an app to, to learn a bit of coding for Python a year ago, but I just did it a few times and never did it again. And now you motivated me again to do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> and um, my question is, I, I have some friends who are really good yeah, software developers and have been coding since they have been teenagers pretty much. And I know that the older we get, the more difficult it is to become really good at coding. How do you think, I mean, what do you think, how many years do you need until you are solid at coding so that you can use it to actually speak properly to your colleagues who might be deep dive techies? <laughs> Well, um, I think there is no definite answer to that because it depends on um, what what is your knowledge. So, how many, how much um, pre knowledge do you already have? How easily do you understand certain um, concepts like object oriented programming? Um, how much time can you dedicate to actually learn how to code? The best would be if you could like invest maybe 15 to 30 minutes every single day. Um, how much of this knowledge will you actually use on the job? So will you be repeating? So there's a lot of different variables in this equation. And then on the other, th other side is what is your expectation? Do you just want to have a basic understanding of code? So like look at the code that I showed you here and you know like, oh, oh yeah, that, that looks like a variable, that looks like an object and somehow something is being done or is like wanting to understand every single line. Well, then that's going to take longer, of course. So it can be anything uh, between six months to like 10 years, depending on your situation, but also on your expectations of what knowledge you want to have. So it's very, very, very individual. And at the moment, for example, I'm coaching somebody who, who really wants to transition into tech. And I think she's about 45 and, um, you know, she's learning week by week. So it's nothing that you say, okay, you can learn how to code until you're 20 and then that's it. Definitely not. I mean, even if you're already retired and you feel like learning to code, great. I'll keep your brains nice and young. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, then I have another question. Um, so I know that when so I'm, I'm looking at transitioning into cybersecurity, I am actually I'm working in the field of, with Microsoft uh, Cloud Computing, mm -hmm. but I'm not coding myself, and or not yet. <laughs> and um, I know that it is always beneficial to have some coding experience or know some coding when you when you become like a cybersecurity consultant to understand certain networks and vulnerabil vulnerabilities, etc. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any experience with that? Do you, do you know where to look for? <laughs> Except on Google, of course. Well, the first thing um, would be to find out what's the technology that is used. Now, um, are you talking about Azure from Microsoft, maybe? Mm, yeah, for example. Yeah, that for would example. be for example. Start, so yeah. um, th that's, that's something I, I don't know. I don't know what they work with, but I could imagine it's with Bash. So that's, um, no, with, excuse me, with PowerShell, which is a mm -hmm. separate language. Um, so it's not like the, the Unix-based languages that we have, like, on uh, Linux or on Apple OS. So first of all, what is, the what is the technology that is used on the tools that you'll be working with or that you work with so that you then go and learn? I personally, I have two different approaches that I like to combine. Um, maybe because I was born uh, in an era pre-YouTube, I also like to read books. So I have a lot of technical books at home, but I like to combine it with Google search, of course, reading on Stack Overflow, but also with YouTube videos. So I like a combination of reading a book, 
trying it out and watching videos, especially when, uh, you know, I still have, I'm not quite sure what I read is correct or to how to interpret it cor um, correctly. So I think that is good. And the other thing is, you know, is there maybe um, somebody you could ask to, to coach you, to help you with it? Um, as I mentioned, I, for example, I coach for, um, uh, I have somebody I'm coaching with and I have probably a second coaching also now coming up for um, program languages that, that I know. So you always have to find the person who also knows the, the technology that you want to learn because there are so many programming languages. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Other questions? There must be other questions. Hi everyone, this is Geraldine, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Um, well, also from my side, thank you very much, uh, Chanel, for this very interesting lesson. And thank you, Geraldine, for the organization. Um, for me, it's very interesting or it's, it's, um, it's not easy to say or to, to um, how do you say, um, what is the difference between all these languages? And do, do I actually have to learn all the languages to discuss with the engineers? Um, because from my perspective, I'm a project manager in IT. And it's interesting for me to challenge the engineers in, in, in the solutions, because sometimes they say, oh, you know, that's not possible. And then I want to go say, okay, I'm not sure if that's not possible because, you know, you can do it like this or like this, and then it's possible probably. So to me, it's, um, it would be really interesting to see also a bit the differences between the languages so that I'm maybe a bit faster in learning. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely do not and you cannot learn all programming languages because depending on the estimations, there's anything between 700 and more than 2,000 programming languages out there. So my, um, the way that I would proceed in your situation is also to find out what is the technology there predominantly working with. Um, it might be JavaScript or Java, two totally different programming languages, and or Python. And then I would try to, you know, look into it. Maybe first um, you know, watch kind of like beginner level YouTube videos and try out really beginner level tutorials. That will give you maybe a little bit of a feel for the for the for the programming language. And on the other hand, what you also could try to do is to learn the concepts of programming. So for instance, if it's Java or um, it, it's an object oriented programming language, find out what is, what does that mean? What does object oriented programming mean? And that would also help you to understand a bit better when they're talking with each other or when they're talking with you. But if it's just for you to have a better understanding of them, you know, don't expect from yourself that you have to speak the same level of code as they can. That, I don't think that's realistic. And on the other hand, just one little tip. If a developer says categorically, that is not possible, it usually means he's, what he's trying to say is, or she, what she's trying to say, I don't feel like doing it that or that way. So, you know, usually um, you can do almost everything with code, and my experience is also from when I didn't know how to code yet and I was an IT project manager and I would hear, oh, that's not possible. Well, it turns out afterwards I found out they just didn't want to do it that way. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've made the same um, experience as myself. Thanks for the explanation. You're welcome. So maybe in general, um, for those of you who are looking to, to maybe try out coding a bit, as I showed you, Google Apps Script is a good possibility. Um, Python, which is really, really big in, in machine learning and in artificial intelligence in general, or data science, is also a good language to have a look at because it's also very beginner friendly. I personally, I enjoy programming in Ruby, very similar to, to Python, but it's not used that much in Switzerland, but it's a good possibility. Uh, JavaScript is also good to start with. And so I would say those were the common languages. What I rather wouldn't look at if you want to start programming yourself would be something like C, C++, C Sharp, 
Java. I know these are especially Java is used a lot in Switzerland and banks and security uh, and insurances. But I think it's a bit more difficult for beginners, and it, it might just you know scare you off. So yeah, I think something like uh, Python or Google Apps Script would would be a good bet. So maybe I have a question for you, Shannon. So oh, okay. What, why did you start then to work with uh, with G Suite? So what was the the, what's the reason behind that? Um, well, first of all, the first time I actually got in contact with it, I heard of it was when I was working as a coding teacher and um, a rather large company in, in Zurich um, approached us and asked if we could uh, do um, trainings, on-site trainings for their um, for their employees. But we're talking about um, user level, so not programming, just user level. And that's what got me into looking at Google Apps Script. I all of a sudden noticed, oh, hey, you can, you can automate. And then, hey, it's, it's just like JavaScript. That's the language I, I worked with. So that's what, first of all, got me interested. And when I had, um, I decided on, you know, founding my own company, starting my own thing, I quickly focused on Google Apps Script and G Suite in general because the, the, Google Cloud is growing. I mean, this has this is top priority for Google, and I believe that a lot of companies who are switching to Google Cloud will also switch to G Suite. They'll ditch their Microsoft Exchange servers and Word, and they'll switch to G Suite. And that again means that a lot of people will be able to automate their day-to-day -day tasks with Google Apps Script. And so it's a combination of I'm interested in it. I believe it has a lot of potential, and so that's the way I'm headed for. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Great. So let me take over the slides then. So, so yeah, thank you very, very much again. Can you see my slide? Yes. Uh, yeah, for this very, very inspiring talk and uh, I, I mean, at least for, for myself and I think Sabrina as well and, and the others, they, they're already very uh, motivated uh, to, uh, sorry, Teresa was it, <laughs> uh, start coding. Um, so um, after this webinar, we actually not only share these key takeaways from you, Chanel, but you also prepared uh, this great presentation and tutorial. So we are going to share um, everything. Um, including the recording um, with you per email after this webinar. So thanks very much, Anel. Um, so as I said in the beginning, uh, we have quite a huge pipeline um, for, of events um, from WeShape Tech. We actually will run this Lunch and Learns uh, on a bi-weekly basis. So the next one is with Dennis and Max, the co-founders of Baterion. And they will talk on 2nd of June about why lithium ion batteries are meant to last and how it impacts the electric mobility. So it would be great uh, to see you there. Then we have a, uh, or two workshops actually planned already. Uh, one is with the SRF in August about uh, performance improvements and A-B testing. And the other one is then at the Swiss Post um, in October um, about visualizing visualizing Black Friday data with the Splunk app. So um, in order to find out more about our events we plan, you can find that again on LinkedIn and on our website. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, it would be great if you subscribe to our newsletter. So we just recently started this webinar, right? And uh, we would really like uh, to continuously improve so if you have feedback, if you have like ideas for, for new speakers, inspiring role models, um, please share it with us. Uh, we, we happily receive your feedback on our webinars. And now, thank you very much for joining today. Uh, I wish you a happy Tuesday afternoon and uh, yeah, enjoy your lunch and talk very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>